In Escape from New York, the island of Manhattan has become the country's only prison, and Snake Plissken must make his way in and back out again to save his own neck. It's about time we looked at another John Carpenter movie, so let's get to it. Welcome everyone to the Atomic Cinema Experiment. I am Peter and joining me as always is Tara. Greetings citizens. This is a science fiction movie podcast. We are currently on 80 season and today we are reviewing a vote winner. Every month on patreon.com slash TV, our voting tier patrons get to vote between three movies and the winner beating out Last Starfighter and something else i can't remember uh the winner was escape from new york and that is what we're going to talk about today john carpenter's film uh from the early he's starring kurt russell and a whole host of other recognizable faces that we'll get into in a minute so uh, we will start spoiler free as we always do for those who uh, are coming into this fresh and we'll give you a warning before we go into the spoilers but the premise of escape from new york is simple it's very high concept but it's very simple it's the future of 1987 and all of uh, manhattan has been walled off from the rest of the world and it has become where the u.s sends all of its prisoners no one gets out there's no guards inside they just get sent in there to fend for themselves and their own little weird society and the president's plane goes down <laughs> in new york and president donald pleasance is running around on his own and they send in a the tough guy to retrieve him they send in snake plissken played by kurt russell who doesn't really give a shit it's a bit of a suicide squad style setup where he, he kind of has to to save his own life and he goes in to try and save the president and escape new york if he can so that is uh <laughs> That's the basic premise of the movie. And Tara, I believe you had never seen this before. Correct. I've never seen it up until today. <laughs> were you... Was, it, was this one you were looking forward to watching? Because it's got a bit of a, a cult following, a bit of a buzz. Yeah. Although I've heard people who don't like it that much. People who I respect also. Hmm. So maybe that's why I've never, like, sought it out. But... Yes, what, what what handsome and genius people could you possibly be referring to? What? <laughs> did I hear it from you? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> and I'm not saying if you did or you didn't. Maybe you did. I don't know. <clears throat> well, I, don't know. I, I feel like maybe I should have because I actually quite like the film. <laughs> um... So I, I I mean I mean I, I that was a bit harsher sounding than I uh this is just based on what you said. Um I I don't love the movie. I, I think I love the premise. I think the opening half hour is really good. I like the music. Yeah. I like uh you know, Kurt Russell being this cheesy, like anti hero type character. Um, I, I do find the rest of the movie a little disappointing, though, and the actual events. What Once he's in the city looking for the president and how things play out, I think are a bit underwhelming and never live up to the movie I think this could be, which is a shame. But, you know... Do you I, want more, like, Running Man style of villains? No, 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 not necessarily. Th th this, this has the potential to, to be way cooler than Running Man. It starts off way mm -hmm. cooler than Running Man. I just don't think it... I, I just think the actual events that take place for the back half of the movie are just kind of underwhelming and dull. Uh, the, like, I, I don't want to spoil anything. We'll get into it all in spoilers, but what I think's kind of mediocre about them. But I, I don't think... A lot, I, I think it, it feels undercooked, a lot of the stuff that happens after the halfway mark for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll get into that. The premise is great. And obviously it's, it's full of style. I was thinking that, like on, uh, from the beginning of the film, I was like, this is like one of the greatest setups that I've ever seen in a film. <laughs> Crime has just been so bad in New York. They just sealed off Manhattan and made it a prison. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, 1988 crime rose by 400%. So this was their... <laughs> so you guys had your chance, but now you're getting all, yeah. you're all locked up in here. Yeah, I think I, I misremembered something. I think I remembered 
there'd been an earthquake in 1997, but I think that's more to do with the sequel uh, than this one. Well, it's in Los Angeles, so that yes. makes more sense. It does, yes. Uh, Manhattan doesn't actually have to be separated from the rest of the country because it's already kind of an island, whereas... <laughs> oh, I see. Whereas LA does need to be separated. When the big one happens, I see. <laughs> uh, yeah. But no, like all, all the the intro is fantastic. Like there's oozing a style, the sort of the the pulsing synth music as we're seeing, just like you know New York at night time. Yeah, this I really giant like wall. The score actually. Yeah, um, I was the... I kept expecting like a rock and roll action score, and it never came. It was always that really cool Carpenter like synthy film. Yeah, so. and I don't think Carpenter actually did the music for this one. It sounds Carpentery. <laughs> but I don't think he actually did the music for this one. Well, he he might have done some because he. I think it's his name is on the IMDb along with somebody else. Is it okay? Yeah, uh, but he didn't. He wasn't the solo composer like he was for Halloween or Assault on Precinct Thirteen. And the the main theme from this does get compared to Assault on Precinct Thirteen a lot actually because it's kind of a similar kind of pulsing to it, but it's got a mm -hmm. different you know melody once it kicks in. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, the music's good. Like, just the, the atmosphere of, like, looking at the city at night time with this big wall up and, like, the, mm -hmm. the, the security force that are just around the whole thing. You got Tom Atkins there in a small role. The leader of this force is uh, Lee Van Cleef. Uh, I was play so excited to see Lee Van Cleef I'm sure and Tom you were. Atkins, but I was really excited for... Because I didn't recognize him at first, and it was, like, 20 minutes into the movie, I went, wait a second, is that Lee Van Cleef? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he plays a character called Hawk, although it's spelled H-A-U-K. Yeah. Because, uh, I don't know. Uh, we get Isaac what, Hayes oops. as kind of the villain sort of overlord of New York <laughs> inside yep. the city. Uh, Ernest Bornine plays like a cab driver who's in the city who's kind of cookie because that's kind of his thing. Harry Dean Stanton's in there is kind of like mm -hmm. a scientist dude <laughs> in the city. Uh, and he's with Adrian Barbeau who's there uh, with uh, her assets uh, <laughs> running around. Well, she was also married to Carpenter, so it's probably another reason why she was there. Oh, sure, yeah, the, the, in the real world, sure. There's, there's, <laughs> I mean, that's why Donald Pleasance is probably here, because he enjoyed working with them in Halloween. Uh, the guy with the sticky up here who works for the Duke, he was in Assault and Precinct 13. There's a lot of, like, little <laughs> things. And I was thinking, because I know Snake Plissken is the inspiration for the character in Metal Gear Solid, but the guy with yes. the hair is like the inspiration for every anime character. <laughs> 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 the Hadoukens, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, you can really see the influence. Uh, and I've not even played that much Metal Gear Solid because I never get into it, but like, there's, there's a moment where like uh, Kurt Russell is in like his little plane and he's only lit by like the red or green light of the screens. And I'm like, this looks like like photos I've seen from Metal Gear Solid, and the like, or like a cutscene that I've seen from Metal Gear Solid. Mm. Uh, the inspirations is definitely there. I actually, I, I uh, do. Do you know just this? This is very loosely connected because of Lee Van Cleef being in the the Dollars trilogy. But um, just on the the inspiration side of things, um, I actually only just found out this week that. Uh, Sergio Leone actually had to pay a out of court settlement to Kurosawa because Yujimbo very clearly was a unofficial remake of uh or sorry, Festival of Dollars was an unofficial remake of Yujimbo. Uh so I don't know. No, I, just, I, I didn't thought know that. Oh yeah, the, the movies are very similar. Just one's a Western, one's a samurai movie. Well, I mean the same with the other films that Kurosawa has done pretty famously, right? Yeah. Has Hollywood ever paid money? <laughs> to to uh Savo for that well i think so i think magnificent sevens is kind of officially a, an adaptation effectively yeah whereas sergio leone just went and made festival of dollars and curacao that's was interesting because like, uh italians like do a lot of ripoffs that's kind of like their style <laughs> yeah but curacao came for him he's like hey your movie's really good but it's also mine <laughs> so interesting i wonder why he was allowed to cross borders and do that I mean, I don't know if he physically went there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, a, that's just all I mean. Like, yeah. you know, you could break state and federal laws here, but international laws, like, do they have international cinema laws? Copyright's an international thing. I mean, I know that there's a period, I don't know if it's still true, but there was a period where I think it was India didn't have copyright, just at all. 
So there's like a bunch of like fake Spider-Man movies and shit from the eighties and stuff <laughs> from India. Because like, hey, anyone can make one. Go for it. Interesting. But yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the Snake Plissken being an inspiration for Snake from Metal Gear Solid is very much there. There's not really well, much. I think um, he has come out uh, and said it himself too. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Hideo K- Kojima. Kojima's a nerd. He he talks about. I think about Carpenter his... like said, "Yeah, it's great because he liked the games or something too." Uh, he loves video games. Yeah, Carpenter always goes on about. His... That's what he, that's what he does now. He doesn't play movies anymore. He plays video games. Uh, huh. He, yeah, that, that's fine. But I, I don't think we can say much more about the actual Snake character from Metal Gear because I don't think either of us have ever played much of the games. So no. But we're acknowledging that the influence uh, has been felt from this movie. And I get it. I get why a lot of things in this movie are influential. I, I actually think this movie is perfect for a remake. Like, And that may sound blasphemous to some. I think the concept is great. I think it's oozing style. And I, kinda, I, I do wish that Carpenter's version was as good as I want it to be. Because I don't think I would like the direction of someone else as much. Well, but... what if you got the um, director of Dread, but like the real director of Dread? Alex Garland? Yeah. Yeah, that could could be good. Uh, Or, you know, I I don't know who else, but I I think the premise is great. I just think that all the events that actually happen once he's in the city looking for the president just need to be completely rewritten (laughs) to be more, you know, (laughs) I would have I would have liked um, some better, you know, gangs. Like, there's... Mm. We get Isaac Hayes, and he's, like, in charge of a lot of the... of the, the people... But you don't really get, like, any other ones. And I would have liked a bunch of rival gangs. Like, it's really unsafe to be there because people are always fighting and have just a really crazy characters. Yeah, there's, like, some stuff where he's, like, running from, like, deranged people for, like, one scene. There's one, like, set piece where he's sort of running from a bunch of crazy people. And it does feel like, yeah, maybe there should be more of that. But it, there, you know, there's a lot of just kind of, like... <sighs> Actually, John, I'm going to compare it to it. It's kind of like once it gets going and it's like him just interacting with people, it kind of reminds me of like an extended version of like a, like one of those episodes of Star Trek that I don't like that much, where like they go into a culture and it's just like talking about the politics of the culture and like finding their way to the leader and the leader's got some weird values and they have to work around. Like there's a lot of that in this. Uh, yeah, for the most part, I don't tend to. Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of that in this, in some ways. Uh, mm. Stylistically, there's a lot of great things going on, and like I, 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 I want to love this. Like when I, when I first read about Escape from New York, I was like, this sounds amazing. This sounds so up my alley. This sounds perfect with Carpenter direction. And every time I watch it, like I always enjoy the first like 25 minutes. I enjoy all the setup, and then once he gets in there, I'm just like. This is just kind of okay. It's not. It's not terrible. I, I don't hate my time with it, but it's never as special as I want it to be. There, there is a ten out of ten from this premise, and the movie doesn't give it to me, and it upset it because it should because it's Carpenter, and Carpenter's given me tens. He's given me absolute masterpieces, and sadly, this just isn't quite there. Yeah. Um. I really did enjoy it though. Like I, I was surprised by the movie because I had expectations of sort of what I'm describing, but I actually was quite surprised at how grounded and almost re- um, realistic it was, um, with the exception of a few things, you know, mm. of the more outlandish stuff. But it seemed a bit more grounded than I was expecting from the premise. I've got a question for you. How did you feel about the car with the chandeliers yeah. over its headlights? <laughs> That's what I wanted more of, Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Actually, it's funny you bring up the different gangs because another movie that I found quite disappointing when I finally saw it was The Warriors, and that also sounded perfect to me, like mm-hmm. as a premise. I've never seen it. Um, and I, I, I remember being disappointed with that because the premise sounded like just this amazing concept for an action movie, and I just didn't love it that much. And I've, not, I've actually seen that once, and it's been a long time, so I might feel differently watching it again because I've not seen that since I was in my late teens. I might feel very differently about that one now. Uh, but I think that and this are the two of the movies that spring to mind when people say movies that like sound great and some people do love them like there's kind of a cult following for both but and I love Carpenter like I like I, I love obviously Halloween and the thing are the ones that are put on the pedestal but I love Assault and Precinct 13 I think that movie's fantastic I think it's way better than this 
I love Prince of Darkness. I, you know, I love tons of Carpenter movies, but I think this is kind of in these middle of his, his road kind of stuff. Pro- probably yeah. a bit better than The Fog, because the concept's better than The Fog. Uh, but I like The Fog a lot. I, the Fog's just okay. And I, I like the cast again. Like, you know, it's got Tom Atkins, it's got Barbeau. Like, you know, he's got some of these faces that we're seeing pop up again. Uh, but I just I don't love that one either. Uh, it just it feels like it's missing a middle act. And I kind of feel the same way about this, actually. I feel like in this, like he gets to the president, without saying too much because we're not in spoilers yet, he gets to the president kind of quickly and easily. And then it's like, we're in what feels like is the third act already. And I'm like, where was the... Where was the actual kind of like going through all the weirdos to get to? And where was the the turmoil and the, the danger? You know, it kind of glosses over it a bit for me. I guess. I mean, he makes alliances along the way and has to do some detective work to find him. Um, yeah, and he had like a cool gadget thing. I was kind of hoping that there would be more inventive stuff like that makes him the best because he's got James Bond-like tech to help him out even. I don't know. There's there's a much more fun version of the film that's in my head, but mm. I, I do like the film, and I appreciate that it was, you know, my fun version would have had the, probably rock and roll soundtrack, and maybe I wouldn't have liked it as much. No, I mean I don't want. It. I mean I I love the music. The music's one of the best parts of the, the whole movie. I for for me I just think the script uh, doesn't fulfill the potential of what the premise has. And it's a shame because I, I like I want to love it so much. I do. On paper, this movie is like made for me. Do you like and the t- character? The snake? I mean, I think I like him because it's Kurt Russell and he pulls it. Oh, I, I think if you hand this character to like a lot of actors, I'd probably hate him. But I think Kurt Russell just has the right line of like badass, cheesy, not taking himself too seriously. Like, he obviously, the character takes himself seriously, but I, you, you get that the actor like knows he's playing like an absurd cheesy badass i do i do love him um and i think i think he is the right actor for it but i think an older version of him would have been more appropriate i feel like he's he's there and he's so young and smooth looking like and everyone's talking about his experience and everyone knows him and his reputation i just he doesn't seem very experienced to me because he's so young (laughs) it's the only thing hey maybe they'll finally do a third movie We'll, we'll get escape from I don't know. Hawaii. Nah, they have to leave the US for the next one. It has to be like Escape from Paris or Escape from... London. Uh, I don't know. Istanbul. How about Escape from... Beijing. (laughs) Nah, they should pick a small place that most people haven't heard of just for the lot. Escape from Isle of Man. There you go. That's got a ring to it. Eh. It's a tiny island. Escape from Palau. <laughs> it's, I feel you're you're just drifting us back towards Hawaii here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Too too much. Uh, oh, there's volcanoes there. There's so much good stuff. If you're going to sell me on volcanoes, then we're going to Iceland. Come on. <laughs> Escape from Reykjavik. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's a good title. Yeah. In fact, speaking of uh, people getting paid for. Uh, ripping things off there's a movie that came out about 10 years ago starring guy pierce that got uh sued for ripping off escape from new york it was it was like a sci-fi movie it was it was like a prison the prison might have been on the moon but it was like someone but basically i assume i've never seen it but i assume the plot was like someone gets sent into the prison to like retrieve someone who's not there or not supposed to be there and like they they actually got sued for it well did they win the lawsuit? I can't, I'll, I'll look it up while she gives some thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because so much is like, so many premises are, you know, taken and expanded upon and redone. Ho- everything in Hollywood's borrowed. So I don't know. The lawsuits, I think, are kind of silly. Yeah, the French film Lockout starring Guy Pierce. Uh,. Is about a CIA pro- operative who is sent to rescue the president's daughter, played by Maggie Grace. Uh, she al- she always gets saved because it's Maggie Grace who gets kidnapped and taken as well. <laughs> oh. uh, from a space prison which has been taken over by violent inmates. Um, blah blah blah. Yes, 
Uh, that sounds great. In 2015, the makers of Lockout were successfully sued by Carpenter for plagiarism and forced to pay him damages of 450,000 euros. Can you get that Warcraft money or something? Carpenter got paid. <laughs> he got paid. <laughs> for not making a movie. For this knockoff <laughs> movie. Um, but he won it. You know, he, he successfully proved or at least convinced people that it was plagiarized. So He doesn't make movies anymore. He hasn't made anything since, what, The Ward? In like 2009 or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while since he's made something. And to be fair, the last few things he made weren't very good, so it's probably good that he just lets it just lets it rest. He's had his time, you know, he had his golden era in the seventies and eighties. Some people may argue a little bit the nineties. you know, I, I probably wouldn't. But seventies, eighties carpenter, you've got a lot of gold there. Yeah. Um and there is a range, like as much as I love Carpenter, there are you know, there are ones I don't love as much, and this is sort of there. The fog's kind of in the sort of mid to lower tier of his eighties stuff, um, but then there's stuff that I love. Uh, there's a nice uh, range. I actually I'm looking forward to watching Christine again because I've not seen it in a long time, and I don't think it clicked with me too much when I was younger, but I feel like I might like it more now. Is that a sci-fi? I mean, it's horror, but it's more horror. Yeah, it's much more possessed car. Than... It's it's sort of similar to Transformers. <laughs> Are you trying to argue your way into getting Christine on the show? <laughs> I like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I bought it on iTunes in 4K like last year when it was on sale. So it's just sitting there waiting for the, the eventual streams episode. Movie. Yeah. I, I suspect I'll probably like it well enough when I watch it again. Because another one actually that I, I didn't, I, I liked but didn't love, but then loved when we did it was They Live. Like They Live like, yeah, had a lot of... amazing. That had like a lot of buzz uh, when I first saw it, just you know from the internet and people talking about it, and I liked it, but I didn't remember loving it. And then when we did it, I was like, "Oh no, this is actually like amazing!" And like this is you know, maybe I just needed to be older, maybe I just needed to like watch it with a different eye, whatever it was. But I was like, "No, what? People are right. This movie's great." And I was kind of hoping that even though I've seen this one a couple times before and always felt kind of lukewarm on it, I was kind of mm -hmm. hoping that this time would be like, "Oh no, this is the time where I'm it's going to click and I'm going to feel it and I'm going to get it." And it was the same as before. Love the setup, love the premise, love like individual sort of characters and like ideas, but I just, I'm kind of just bored with the last like 45 minutes of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was surprised that um, Snake was not as superhero as I was expecting him to be. I was expecting him to be more of like the action traditional action hero, like a mm. like um like Stallone plays or Schwarzenegger plays, but he actually like gets caught a lot and like his plans get foiled a lot. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of interesting that uh, they wrote a character and played a character that, you know, is not the best <laughs> like people are, are furious, you know. Oh sure. That was kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the fact that he can lose is is good because it means there's stakes to things. It means he's valuable, and it means he can. He's, he's you know, there's 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 potential threat every time he encounters a problem. He's not just going to magically get his way out. Yeah, of it. but so much of it is also luck. He's kind of got like the Indiana Jones factor, also, mm. where just luck seems to be on his side. He's also he also doesn't actually care about what he's doing except for the fact that he'll die if he doesn't do it. So it's, yeah. he, he doesn't care about the present. He doesn't care about anything. He you know when he talks to people, he's not like like I you know I'm in I'm, I'm impassioned and devout about saving the day here. He's like no, get me what I want because I need to. But you know he's, he's got a very I don't give a shit about you attitude like the yeah. entire time. Yeah, totally. So. He's a fun character, though, and I do like Kurt Russell a lot, so it's easy to like him. But I think Kurt Russell slightly older would have been better. It is funny, actually, now where I'm watching him in this, and I'm like, because he's got the longer hair and he's got the stubble, I'm like, you know what? I can see his son in him. Like, I can see a little bit of Wyatt Russell here because he's got the oh, long hair and the, the stubble, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I was thinking that that long hair comes back again and he filleted really well. <laughs> sure. I mean, he already had the long hair in the thing, so he's, he's just kind of kept it for Carpenter. Although, he's yeah, going to lose... that's like his look, you know? 
He's going to cut it a bit, though, for uh, Big Trouble in Little China, which is uh, also not sci-fi, Tara, I'm afraid. Maybe maybe, yeah. well, maybe, a, maybe a smidge. That's okay. But you guys can do it over there on your other show. Well, yeah, that's not even a horror movie. That's That'd be collector's cut. That'd be... God, what, what? Is, is there like enough Carpenter movies that aren't horror or sci-fi that would be worth doing? <laughs> like a Carpenter sure season? A collector's cut? Oh, jeez. Yeah, I'd have to actually sit down and like whittle them out. But yeah, uh, Precinct 13, Big Trouble. Uh... <laughs> Not vampires. Is that it? Is, is that... Because most of his fellow Oh, uh, no, because Memoirs of a Visible Man, that's still sci-fi. It's comedy, but it's still sci-fi. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I don't, he's dug out a lot of non-sci-fi or horror, has he? It mostly falls into that. I guess not. Oh, well. Life will find a way. The real question is, is what show gets Ghost to Mars? Because it's arguably both horror and sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I'm leaning towards Ace because it's got I mean it's got Mars in the title. It's I feel Mars. yeah, I feel like Mars just makes it an ace show. Yeah. It just does. Uh even though there's ghosts also in the title, which are traditionally more of a horror thing. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you you gotta pick your battles. You gotta pick you your battles. Ghost. Maybe, maybe yeah. There's just a hologram. They're holograms. Is it like Doom? I've never seen it, so I don't know. I've only heard the tales of how bad Ghosts of Mars is. I've, I've, I've never found the courage of watching it, which is why whenever we do eventually do Ghosts of Mars, it'll be the first viewing. So astronauts make it to Mars, and it's haunted. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing premise. <laughs> I don't know if that's quite the premise, because I, I, I could be wrong, but my, my impression is, is that there's already, like, civilization on Mars, that they've already got, like, a base or something, at least. Okay. Okay. I think I, so it's I, I don't by know. Human spirits. I, I I really I don't know. Like I I just based on images, it looks like there's it's not just like Martian rocks. It looks like there's other stuff there. So I I thought that people were already there for a while, but I could maybe be there's an ancient civilization they uncover. <laughs> oh yeah, because and that's haunted. We haven't seen that done before. <laughs> All these ancient civilizations on Mars. Um, I won't, yeah. I mean, it's always been done well. Has it? <laughs> <laughs> Tara? We technically watched two movies that had it. <laughs> I can only think of one. What was the second one? Um, Total Recall. Oh, okay, alright. Okay. I like that you got which one I was thinking, so you knew which mm -hmm. one to tell me. Very good. Yeah. Very good. We're in... We're, we got the... Not the Gary Sinise one. We got, we got the wavelength <laughs> going there. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, I guess we'll just give spoiler warning then, so we can talk freely about Escape from New York. Um, so, yeah, the movie opens with the explanation and some cool music as to what's going on. The 1988 crime rose by 400 percent. So Manhattan became this prison wall around it. Uh, no one gets out. Yada yada yada. But it. One of the things that I, I thought from memory they elaborated on a bit more, and it's kind of weird that they don't almost, is that the reason why the president's plane goes down was when it's going over Manhattan is because it's actually taken over by like a, a resistance who are like, we're the, you know, the liberation of, of the USA and this fascist is going down. And it, like, and I thought, because I remembered how it ended. I remember, you know, it ends with Snake with the, the tape and like he mm -hmm. makes this choice. And I was kind of, in my head, I was like, I think by the end, we're like, we're kind of like free to root for that because it's kind of made clear that, you know, he's not like a, a fascist like Hitler or anything, but, it, you know, the, the current regime they is bad. A, they have a prison state. <laughs> yeah. But they don't really elaborate it on much. Like, other than the fact that there's a resistance at the start who crashes the pl like, plane, there's not really anything to tell us like what their policies are other than this one state that's a prison right that's the only yeah. thing we've got but other than that we don't know what their policies are we don't know like what else they're doing in the country like we can assume they're awful and like treat like minorities poorly and like i mean they voted for <laughs> donald pleasance he's typically a villain <laughs> He's also typically not American. <laughs> yeah. I, do, I, do so I was far. listening for it, though, but he's he's really good at accents. Was he doing an accent? I thought he just had his normal voice. No, he was he was not British, and he was not speaking British. 
I don't know. Whenever I hear him yell, I just hear his English accent. I don't. I don't hear American accent. Mm. No, I thought he did a pretty good job, actually. No, because one of the points I was going to make is that despite the fact that he sounds English the entire time, I never question that he's president. It just kind of works for some reason. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if it's because he's got he's kind of got the posture for it. He's he's got the gravitas, but he just he feels like a president. Doesn't matter Maybe. that he's English. He doesn't speak too much in the movie, and I was listening for it. Not not since Bob Hoskins as an Italian plumber have I been so convinced of an Englishman playing a role that he shouldn't be playing. <laughs> Uh, but yes he's uh he's president uh and uh he he gets like a safety escape pod off the plane um there's a little bit of like intrigue at the start actually because you're following lee van cleef and tom atkins being like hey there's some plane called david 14 but it's a code name and then it reveals that wait a minute this is actually air force one oh shit so the president jetson's out on his little egg and lands <laughs> in new york and it's like shit we gotta pod. we gotta do something and lee van cleef hot decides to enlist nick pliskin and it's very suicide squad it wouldn't in fact this predates suicide squad and it would not surprise me if part of the inspiration for suicide squad was this because mm-hmm. he literally has a bomb in his neck it's not going to blow up his head they specify it's only like a little tiny explosive that will blow up a blood vessel but yeah the arteries on yeah. either side but that's like i was like oh this is very suicide squad like they that because Suicide Squad was created a bit later in the 80s, so I think this is very definitely an inspiration. This, like, Lee Van Cleef, I never thought about it before, but he's the inspiration for Amanda Waller. <laughs> That's what he is. <laughs> Angel eyes. Uh, yeah. I, I was thinking that they, they, the implants are there, so in case they have to demonstrate, um, they wouldn't have to actually do any special effects for the explosion mm. <laughs> for the head. Yeah. Well, that, that's I that. just die. That's the problem with Suicide Squad is they always have to have that one red shirt who dies like really quickly. So they just to prove to all the rest of them, yeah, this is a real threat. Like his head just exploded. <laughs> like they always have to do that. Like, yeah. like, like you didn't see that cast for that first movie and didn't go, well, Slipknot's going to make it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> that said, I wish I never made it to the end of that movie myself, but that's, that's what was fun. <laughs> so, uh, the, the reboot was good. Oh yeah, James Gunn's obviously a much better filmmaker than <laughs> whatever that monstrosity in 2016 was. Oh, um, it's one of the worst ex- theater experiences of my life. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, I'd probably feel worse about it if, if Batman v Superman wasn't a few months before. <laughs> like that was even worse. Uh, so anyway, uh, so Snake's given this this thing. He's not happy about the the implants, obviously, because you know Lee Van Cleef's like. Yeah, you're thinking about turning that little plane around and going to Canada. I can see it in your eye. You know, not eyes, because mm-hmm. he's got an eye patch. <laughs> uh, yeah, very clever. Yeah. Uh, so he's like, yeah, you're going to like do this or you're going to die. Like, There's this account down on your, your watch. This is when the, this is going to dissolve and going to blow up your, your vessels. And he's like, shit. So he's got a timer. We have a countdown. It's just under 24 hours. Um... Which I actually think is a slight mistake, just in the sense that, uh, from from just from like a, the look of the movie, I thought it would have looked better if when they're just making the final escape and the, the clock's ticking down, if that was happening at dawn when like the sun was rising. But it's already it's like it's we've went through day already and we're back to night time mm-hmm. by the time they're coming out, and I was just like, no, it, you haven't. Day have it, felt really short. Also, yeah. ha- have it be magic or have it be all just the one night? He's got say 12 hours right give or take and mm-hmm. that's how long you've got it would tighten things up a little bit make it you know and then we can end at the magic hour when they're rushing to the thing but anyway so maybe they did it in the sequel i can't remember i've seen escape from ellie once i do not have fun memories <laughs> of it i've never seen it obviously yeah um Interestingly, I think Steve Buscemi's in it, which is notable and only in that the guy with the spiky hair I thought looked like a like a discount Steve Buscemi. <laughs> he he was quite insane looking, very yeah. big eyes. He, he doesn't look like Steve Buscemi normally when he's he's in Assault and Precinct Thirteen. He doesn't look like Steve Buscemi there, but here when he's doing these crazy faces, he, he's got yeah. a bit of a Steve Buscemi kind of look to him. Yeah, uh, I was getting that vibe. Uh, Hello, fellow kids. Yes, how do you do, fellow kids? Uh, I mean, this guy's probably older than Steve Buscemi, because Steve Buscemi, you know, this is like a decade before Reservoir Dogs, so mm-hmm. this guy's probably older, I imagine. So if anything, Steve Buscemi's the... Uh, what's the opposite of discount? The 
the the premium version of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> The luxury, the luxury of Buscemi experience. Mm, the bougie. <laughs> the bougie one. Bougie Buscemi. <laughs> bougie Buscemi. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> yeah. Um, so they get on this little plane. Uh, so we have to talk about how something here has not aged very well. And it's not their fault. They could not have known when they made this movie. But how does Snake Plissken get into New York City, Tara? Well, he has to fly on top of the World Trade Center. He has to land a little plane on top of the World Trade Center, which, you know... Uh, I mean, every time you see it now on screen, like, it's it's always going to be jarring, and then especially if they mention it, then, yeah, it's it's always going to be a bit sad. Yeah, but, I mean, he's, he's landing a plane on it. I mean, that's a little bit, like... A glider. The thing's so small. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying there's a problem with it. Obviously, they didn't know. This is just like a like a sad irony because of like what happened in the world afterwards. But it's it, true. I mean, I just it it didn't really like. Um, I wasn't like shocked by it because there there's already a build up. Like you saw the silhouette of the city and the two towers were like the the biggest things there, right? So you saw that, and then they were talking about the World Trade Center, and then they talked about the the small plane. I was going to land on it. And then there was never a moment where I was like, oh, this is too much or whatever, you know, because it was just building on top of the initial sighting of the World Trade Center already did that. I mean, I'm not saying there's a moment you should have felt it was too much, but I'm, the first time I watched this movie, which would have probably been like 2003 or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, it was kind of like, wait, what's happening? They're doing mm-hmm. what now? You know, it kind of was like, holy <laughs> shit. This is, uh, just feels weird now because of what's happened. So, um, I, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's an interesting detail. And they, they go back there a few times in the movie as well. It's like, they, they sort of feature prominently, uh, which makes sense because, you know, it's, it, it literally was the biggest landmark in New York City. So yeah. I, I get it. I get why they used it. Um, I always get a case of, like, I, I'm not necessarily scared of heights generally, but, I'm not fond of really tall skyscrapers, so whenever there's a movie that's like, up on top of the World Trade Center, like I feel it, like that movie with Joseph Gordon Levitt, The Walk, about the the guy doing the tightrope. Even mm-hmm. even before he's on, like for some reason, when he's out in the tightrope, it doesn't really bother me that much because it's like, ah, oh, this is the stunty part, and this is like what he did and whatever. But even just when they're standing at the edge of the the roof, I'm like, one gust of wind <laughs> is all it's going to take. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I feel that sense of vertigo when I when uh, yeah and I, and I don't feel it otherwise like I am fine from any reasonable height it's this I'm not like fussed about that like I'll climb a ladder and be quite happy it's it's the like we are in the clouds levels of height where I'm a bit uh, <laughs> like I don't want to trip I sometimes I trip a lot I and I'm fine when I'm on ground level because I just I just you know break my fall it's fine. <laughs> Sometimes you trip a lot. Are you, are you okay? I don't know. I just have two left feet sometimes. There's nothing. Yeah. It doesn't happen that often, but it would be just my luck. It would happen when I'm standing on top of a skyscraper. <laughs> have you seen the, um, I think it's in, is it Manila or Malaysia rather? I don't know. There's some building that has like a, a glass walkway so you can I hate step it. outside no. on the sky. Scraper, I don't want to just do it. look down. I'm getting that. I think uneasy. there's one in um, the Grand Canyon also. Yeah, I'm but gonna... the the one I'm thinking of, it's some. I think it's some Asian country. I can't remember, but the <laughs> you can step on it and it has digital glass that'll break, <laughs> so you can step on it and a crack will appear and then disappear just to further mess with people who are already like Mm-mm. brave enough to <laughs> step out on the glass. <laughs> There's like, there's no need to tempt fate, okay? There's no need. I, I, th- just like the universe hates me, and it would just love to mess with me by mess, me- just giving me some dumb death at a moment. You would just end up a cautionary tale. I, I, I would just like I'm destined to like fall to my death and land two feet away from a trampoline. That's like uh, where I'm standing on things. So. Yeah, but yeah, so he has this big entrance and he, he even tells Van Cleef, like, I'm going to kill you when I get back because, like, you've pissed me off. 
kind of thing. So he gets into the city, and all this build up is great. You know, like Snake Plissken arriving at the center, and then like the the slow unraveling of what's going on. Okay, the president's there, and they even go in with some helicopters and some forces to try and get him, but he's already gone. And that's when Spiky haired Bashemi comes out and is like, you know, if you are not gone in thirty seconds, he dies. If you try and come back, he dies. And they all just have to sort of run and escape. So it's like, oh, we can't just send in a force because they'll retaliate. We have to send in someone who looks like he belongs there. And Snake was literally just about to go there as a prisoner anyway. Like, he, he mm-hmm. you know, we don't get a lot of stuff about Snake's past. We know that he was, like, a hero in the military and then kind of, like, fell away from that and then robbed a bank or something, I think they said. Which, it's kind of interesting that so many people on the inside have heard about him because it kind of feels like he like wh- when did he turn to this life of crime that all these people that have been trapped in the city for however long all I'm know about he's him. not old enough it, it, yeah it's just a bit <laughs> weird timeline wise but that's that's fine um it's uh once he's there though then there's some cool shots of him like going around the streets and it's a little post-apocalyptic with you know there's like some fire burning here or there and some garbage piling up because it's not like it's not like the criminals have arranged like you know proper garbage disposal or anything. do you do you think it would have been more satisfying if snake Plissken was more like sean connery in the rock where he was a little bit older and then he was like oh i have a reputation here because i escaped once that's why they recruited me to go get the president um i don't know if i would like the trope that he's already escaped and that's why they're sending him in oh, i mean it would work don't get me wrong but i don't know if i like that part but i don't, I don't mind the idea that he's old it doesn't bother me that he's not though mm. okay <laughs> that's, that's fine I, it only bothers me because everyone keeps like saying, i've heard of you i'm like mm-hmm. really well, why why have you all heard of him it feels yeah i don't know i mean is i guess inside me not all of them have been there for that long. Because, like, Harry Dean Stanton, they mentioned, like, he betrayed Snake Plissken, like, four years ago. So, you know, he's only been here at most, like, just under four years. Maybe a bit less than that. Maybe so, that's why they've all heard of him. Well, because Harry Dean Stanton can't shut up and keeps talking about the legend of Snake Plissken. And he's got he's got a title, right? He's the brain, so people go to him. Important yes. people. Well, he isn't, like, his real name, like, Howard or whatever it was. Harold? Harold? That was Harold. Yeah, you're right uh so i think my, my disappointment really comes from like one snakes in here and he goes snooping there is a nice scene where it's like a bunch of crazies are coming after him and he has to like sort of escape through a building and he's like climbing up like the fire escape and whatnot he that... kissed a woman and then she immediately died <laughs> he didn't kiss her oh she was going in to kiss him she she, she was trying to seduce him because thinking that he could take her out like she wants to escape but she, she he doesn't kiss her though there was no actual contact Right. It was right at the, right at the edge. Then, she she was trying to seduce him, thinking that it was her way out. Uh, but then I she mean, you just got distracted because you know, people from the sewers are coming out. Sh- sure, I mean I, I don't know. He's not really got time for you know, that's he's he's got a clock. He's not got time for a bit of slap and tickle. I mean, he didn't he didn't escape from that spot as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> He stuck uh, around there for a little bit longer. But, you know, he runs into Ernest Bornine, who's this, who's the cabbie character, and he sort of, like, shows up to, like, get him away from the crazies when he's being chased. He just casually throws a Molotov cocktail into the alleyway to sort of, like, stop them from coming. And they get to talking, and I think from here is where it just starts to feel kind of like, oh, he knows where he can go and talk to someone, so he takes them to the brain. And that turns out to be Harry and Dean Stanton, who he's got a history with, and he's with Adrian Barbo. And he works for the Duke. So that leads to the Duke. Oh, the Duke's got the president. So, oh, we can tell you where he's got the president then. And then from here, it's just, oh, they betray him. And then he's captured. I think that's my big thing, is that we go from like him arriving in the city, and not a lot happens, and all of a sudden, as soon as he gets to the president really quickly, and he's immediately captured, and we get like him in like, a gladiator-style bit of combat in a in a boxing ring uh mm-hmm. for all the criminals to watch and and that's the point of the movie where i'm just kind of sad where i'm like why is th- why is this this the movie like i, I don't know i I'm sure there's more interesting things we could do that he's put into a gladiator arena i mean i know they were the crazies but i sort of wish that they were like 
the sewer mutants that have been people who long ago like went into the sewers and they've been mutated from all the toxic waste or whatever has been pumped through New York. I mean, they're um, still just criminals, Tara. They're not. There's no mutations happening here. But I want that. <laughs> I want the Futurama New New York mutants that live in the sewers. I'm okay with them not being mutants. I, I, that's not my issue here. My my issue is just how unsatisfying the adventure, I suppose, is. To, to sum up in the word, I think the adventure of the movie is really lackluster. You know, the... Yeah, okay. I thought the the fight scene was kind of fun, though, because it, it just changed things up a bit, and we got, like, a, a burly-looking guy who was a fun character. I just... Like, set up, you know, some obstacles and have them, like, have to figure out a way to get through the obstacle, right? Or, like, you know, you're setting up the Duke as this kind of villain and he he's, he's got a plan that he's going to, like, sort of walk out over the bridge with the president in front and they've got schematics where all, where all the mines are that are, you know, there to stop them from just leaving. And that's, like, the idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that's fine, right? But he doesn't know that they're on a timer, that the president's only useful to the country for another day. Because the president has a tape on him that is going to convince uh, people at this international summit to, I think the Soviets and China specifically, to basically stop the war. Stop, stop whatever fighting's going on in the world right now. He's going to, like, something to do with fusion. They, there's, like, a, a brief mention of, like, nuclear fusion early on. So the recording's got something to do with that. So maybe this is going to try and broke peace by saying, hey, we've figured out cheap and free energy for everyone or something. But they don't go into it too much. You never quite hear exactly. Wait, it's, it's, if that's true, then like, isn't Snake the bad guy <laughs> at the end? Well, that's why I was. That's why I was complaining earlier and saying I wish there was more details and context for the world a little bit, mm. and whether or not we should like be rooting for his decision at the end. Mm. I don't think I caught that. That's what it was. I thought that he was. Uh... I thought the tape was going to be damning, like just another political leader or something. No, they said something. They said it was something to do with scientist infusion. They definitely had said those words. So okay, okay. Uh, they never. I mean, never gone into details exactly, like what they're going to say on it or why or you know, you know, like I don't know if that was what the pitch was going to be. Is like here's like we've cracked fusion, so <laughs> we're going to share it with everyone. Or well, I mean, could they not just do that again? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt Donna Plens is, is the scientist that also create, you know, came up with nuclear fusion. Uh, that's true. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know why it's like this tape's the only proof of whatever it is he's got to prove. Like, they again, they they kind of leave it very vague. It's it's almost like the Pulp Fiction briefcase where they're intentional leaving it very open, so there's no need to explain the specifics mm-hmm. of why it is like one of a kind and why it's like you know, it's just this is the MacGuffin. And that's what it is, that's all it is, and that's fine. And the ending, even if Snake's technically dooming the planet to more, like, you know, World War Four, or World War Five, or whatever they're on at this point, um, you kind of like go, ah, oh, well, he doesn't give a shit, so why should we? Because, like, that's the whole point. He's a badass, he doesn't care. Um, obviously, the one thing it does give you, though, is it has him test the president a little bit. So, after they get out of the end... Uh, he goes up to the president as the president's getting like shaved and cleaned for his like because he, he can't make it to the summit he's too far away now but he can like broadcast this tape to try and like make the difference anyway mm-hmm. so he's going to broadcast it and he's sitting yeah. there getting pampered and snake says i just want to ask you know a minute of your time that's all i want in return uh for saving you and he's like sure what was it? it's like a lot of people died getting you out how do you feel about that and he just kind of says oh well i'd like to thank them too they're you know, they're heroes or something. And he, but he's kind of, sort of like looking... for their sacrifice. Yeah. He's looking at his reflection and sort of like looking at, like, how his, like, shave job's coming. He's, he's just clearly just sort of saying it while he's not paying attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of like, that's the thing. Is like, okay, that's the moment where Snake decided not to give them the real tape. Like, he's already given them the fake tape. That, has, that already happened. But I feel like if he got a better answer and he felt like the president actually cared about the people who died, like, getting him out, he might have, like, you know, fessed up and said, here's the real tape. But he didn't. Yeah, left it on a table or something. So, uh, they play the tape and it's just music and he looks like an idiot and the movie ends with him ripping the tape out. We skipped to the end because what we were talking about led to it. Obviously, we're going to go back and talk about the other stuff, but... (laughs) Um, 
yeah i like the, the the end moment is cool like him walking away with the tape ripping out is cool and i this is the thing i wish the actual middle of the movie was more exciting and made me care about this like group of weirdos because i think they're going for the ragtag ensemble they're, they're kind of going for a a suicide squad or, or or even like a tarantino sort of like reservoir dogs thing where this is a group of like misfits who aren't like good people but they're kind of empathetical and likable mm-hmm. and you know, I want to care when Harry Dean Stanton steps on a mine and blows up, and then Adrian Barbeau wants to avenge his death and, like, stand their ground with that ridiculous, like, handgun that's got, like, a big scope on it <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> um, yep. So, like, I, I want to care about... Cool. You know, but, like, I think the, the best example is the cabbie dies because the, the, the car runs over a mine. And, and the car splits in half. Yeah, but, like, we see him lying there dead, and, like, Snake kind of, like, pulls him over to, like, look at him. And I thought it was kind of weird that we don't get a reaction shot of Snake. You know, it, it, he just kind of, like, walks away. And it's actually hard to tell. And maybe this is intentional. Maybe this is the point that Carpenter's going for, is that we don't know how Snake feels about these people dying on, like, on their way out of the city. Like, you know, because we get the impression early on that Snake doesn't really care about anyone. But... Like, maybe, like, that's the kind of the point is the ending reveals that he did kind of care about all these people given their lives, despite the fact that he didn't really have, like, a friendly relationship with all of them. I'm sure he at least agrees that the uh, the president should care. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the cabbie was the one who was always nice to him and was always, like, kind of, like, yeah, he was he a bit annoying. Him. Yeah. Because he was, you know, he was very in his face and, like, wouldn't shut up and stuff. But he's, he's kind of that innocent soul in a way. I mean... Obviously, he's in this prison, so maybe he's not completely innocent. But and you, and you get, um, but you get Ernest Borgnine, and he's a really likable actor. Like it's easy yeah, to yeah. to be on his side. Yeah. He's always fun. He's always got that huge smile. He's got a funny looking face, so it's easy to smile at him. <laughs> yeah, I I think it would have been nice to really care about the fact that these guys are all given their life, and it would probably make the ending hit harder. You know, the fact that Snake rips that tape up after he really sees the president doesn't give a shit and it's all like you know he did all this because he had to because he would die if he didn't but it's almost like at the end he's checking to see if it was worth doing as well like was it worth mm-hmm. saving this asshole and the president's just a, you know he's a politician he's a scumbag uh it's all about him and then he makes this grandiose speech he's like oh yes hopefully our great nations will all prevail i am when he play this tape in hope of peace between our worlds and then, you know, music starts playing and then he looks like a tit. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I just, I wish I cared more about all these characters dying because I feel like it would help the ending a lot. And I think a lot of it is just them, them running around. Like, there's not a lot of interesting actual set pieces with them in the middle uh, to make them kind of bond or anything like that. Uh, there, there's like an interesting little thing with Hardin Staten where he actually tries to steal the tape and steal the president and like fly him out himself because mm-hmm. uh, he figures out where snake must have landed with the glider and it's like yeah, okay okay yeah a little bit of betrayal i suppose which is um the reason that maybe he's even in the prison is because i don't know he betrayed snake before yeah, and he keeps betraying them. I think that's the other thing. I'm not necessarily that one a, a heartfelt like bond that Snake forms with someone, but it does kind of feel like there's never even like a, I don't know, like a, a maybe like a mutual respect with someone that forms. You know, with, with I mean, he shakes pelt. Barbo's hand when he understands that she's staying behind. Yeah, yeah. But again, I guess I, the closest. But I, I do think it's undercooked. I, I, I think by the time we get to them all running away in the like the car and try to escape the city, I think like there to the end's fine. Like I think the, the way it plays out after that is completely fine. But I don't mm-hmm. think I care enough about all the characters that, to really care about what happens to them along that way. So I just really wish that before that point, you know, from when Snake lands in the city to when they're making their escape, I really wish that middle portion just gave me more actual fun exciting things to do and more stuff where snake actually gets to show why like he's good at what he does and i'm not saying he has to succeed at everything but it does kind of feel like he just like you know like before he gets captured all we really see him do is like kill two guys that were guarding the president and like Mm -hmm. the president kind of reacts and is like whoa you're here and like you know snake starts untying him and whatnot but we never really get a, a great sense of like 
like what he can really do like why does he have this reputation i'm not so sure the movie actually shows us that at any real point mm. you know yeah i would probably uh i agree with that that's why i, I kind of wish that the movie had more of, of a you know the trope of like oh new york is a character but like i wouldn't have mind having more of that like different factions like the central park area is where you have I don't know, a certain group versus, like, the Brooklyn area or whatever, you know? I guess everything's Manhattan. I don't really know how Manhattan's divided up all that well, except from the Spider-Man game. <laughs> That's how I know Manhattan's map, yeah. You get Hell's Kitchen, you got the Upper West Side, blah, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I just... I think... If the actual city had more of a character, I think that would be more interesting. And you can use the tropes of, of New York that everyone knows anyway to sort of create different factions and different types of uh, of people that he has to come across. Yeah, that sounds fine. I, I think my bigger problem, though, is that it, it just needs to have, like, more, like, clear things for them to do, I guess. Like, it, it kind of feels like they're just running back and forth and betraying each other as opposed to, okay, here's the goal, here's where we have to get to across this bridge, but to get to that bridge, we have to run away from Duke. But maybe there's also other obstacles. Maybe there's other things yeah, to Yeah, I, I wasn't a huge through. fan of Duke either. I mean, um, Isaac Hayes is fine and all, but except for his Scientology. But <laughs> oh, I didn't know he was Scientologist. That's just yeah. To me. That's why he left South Park because they made fun of Scientology. Really? Okay. All right. Uh, he's got presence at the very least. I think he's he's fine in that sense. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, he definitely has screen presence, but I don't know. Like, um, I, I thought overall, like, there was something missing about um, his um, him to be a bit more threatening. Actually, that does make me think of one thing that I did like is, uh, and this is like another sign that the president's not really a nice man that's actually worth saving. That he's kind of a dick, uh, which I guess makes you just think that maybe his policies are sh are shit and his entire like, political party is also shit, and that's why it's okay that Snake did what he did at the end. But it's uh, when he actually gets lifted out of the wall, and Snake's like on his way up, and the Duke's going to like kill Snake, as the president ends up like firing a machine gun mm -hmm. into uh, Duke, and he just starts yelling, because there's a moment in the middle of the movie, uh, after they've like kidnapped Snake as well, and they've got the president like chained up against the wall, and the Duke's just like firing Snake's gun around the president, and like saying, hey... What have you learned, President? And he's making him say, Duke is the king of New York and uh, Duke is uh, number one, right? Number one something, in the game or something. Yeah, like it was something that. like that, yeah. Uh, so the President at the end, when he's firing the gun at Duke, and he's like, he fires a couple, you know, he's already killed him. Like, the first couple of bullets kill him, but he keeps firing the machine gun at him and he just starts yelling, the Duke is number one! Bang, 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 bang! Duke is king of New York! Bang. He comes off unhinged. <laughs> like, he's getting this, like, sick revenge because of the way he was, like, tortured. And he was, like, you know, what happened to him wasn't pleasant, but he still comes off in this scene feeling like, yeah, I don't know if I'm completely on board with your <laughs> your uh, <laughs> approach to this here. Uh, certainly, certainly from a mental health state, I don't feel like you're all there, but, yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm glad he did um, save, uh, save Snake, because I thought he, w he wasn't going to. I thought that would have been the thing where they're like, yeah, mm. You know, thanks for doing this, but we were still going to explode your head anyway, so just stay behind. Yeah, to be fair, there's a reason... And then I mean, you would have to find another way out. There is a reason why, though, they do, like, let him get out, because uh, Van Cleef, uh, Hawk, uh, after this is all over, Hawk's like, hey, you know, we, we could be partners. <laughs> you know, I, I've got other missions that I could send you on. We could be quite the team. So it's, it kind of implies that part of the reason why there was no intention to double cross yeah. Snake if he did pull off the mission was like, hey, we can use him again. This can be like an ongoing thing. Again, he wants to be the colonel to Snake's um, Rambo. <laughs> sure. No, I think that I think the Suicide Squad comparison sticks. That this is this is Amanda Waller wanting to use you know Deadshot over and over again or whatever you know. Mm. Uh, like I th 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 that that makes enough sense. Uh, and Snake doesn't kill him. Because uh, he's quote unquote too tired. <laughs> I mean, I believe he's tired. I mean, that's the other thing. He like sleeps for like half of the time that he spends in the city. Because when when he get when they kidnap him, they knock him out. Uh, yeah. 
and he wakes up and it's the morning because yeah, we don't really get a lot of daylight scenes yeah or yeah like we got a couple of there's a couple of nice shots of, like the helicopters flying around at daytime there's like synth music playing and it's mm-hmm. like shit is if we lost snake you know they're thinking you know they're getting worried in the outside like what do we do um and the atmosphere of that stuff's cool but because he wakes up like halfway through the day it feels like we skip a bunch of this this time period that he was at. like i really do think condensing it down to more like 10 hours and then like making it a bit more of a time crunch um mm-hmm. and have him just be or not even him just have the have, have just have a couple more set pieces to make it feel like he's actually going through some stuff i don't know i just i feel like it's a bunch of characters like talking to each other and betraying each other and then it's time to to leave i don't know like i feel like the movie skips like a an act where it was going to make me like really care about everything and i, I just i don't know if i ever feel like i do mm. Mm. um yeah i mean i i I have similar feelings in that um i really did enjoy the film but there was nothing that really hooked me like i was expecting it to i guess i had an image of what this movie was maybe i was thinking it was more big trouble little china than it was Mm. escape from new york what it actually is yeah i i think that's the thing like i still i still enjoy parts of it. i still love the premise and i love carpenter's direction and the music and all that other stuff we've mentioned but yeah. I, 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 even if you do enjoy it, I think there is it is missing that thing that makes it a great movie and makes it like potentially a masterpiece. Like, like Halloween, the thing I think are you know great, and, I, and even Assault and Precinct Thirteen, which is not considered a masterpiece by any means, but like, I, I think that is an excellent little action movie. It's so perfectly paced. The premise is simple. They and live effective. also. Yeah. They live like. I, I just I think this is just missing something and and it's it's in the script it's just the basic script at its core is just missing like the the, the story just doesn't quite have it and it's a shame because like the potential is there which is why you know when people bring up like, what do you think should get a remake like, I don't want them to remake a good movie I want them to remake a movie that had potential that didn't live up to it and yeah. I think Escape from New York for me is the first thing that usually comes to mind because it's like this this could be great this could be amazing um, um, Epidemic 2 I'm not going to dignify that with a response oh okay our minds work very differently you think Epidemic 1's perfect but Epidemic 2 needs a remake yeah Epidemic 2 I mean it is kind of already a remake of 1 but technically a continuation but still mm-hmm. pretty good. Just, you know, could definitely use a remake. You know, special effects are not great. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, because they have special effects from what I've seen in clips of Birdemic 3. They, they, they upped their game. Yeah, very good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, like, sadly, I'm kind of coming out of this review feeling exactly the same way that I did when I came in, which is a flawed film that I wish I loved because it feels like I should love it, but... Uh, it just like the actual story once it gets going just never hits it never hits for me at all it's Mm -hmm. missing it's just it's missing the progression in the story that makes me really care about the characters and it's missing the because when you watch i I think the reason why i can compare it to assault and precinct 13 is because the other carpenter action movie but it's also the one that also kind of has similar like badass characters like the the prisoner in that that ends up like helping the cop like you know defend the precinct he's kind of like a prototype of snake plissken he's kind of similar in demeanor uh and i think that movie like has that bond between him and the cop where but by the end it's like oh there's this respect because they had to work together kind of thing and i just i think this movie's missing that element of some yeah. kind you know something yeah, that makes okay. me go oh like you know i felt something because of like this and i don't know if i just never felt anything for any of these characters right so okay. yeah so yeah sadly I, I don't love escape from new york i wish i did but well uh this is my first time so um i went in a little bit blind i really i hadn't seen or i didn't really know very much i think i just knew the premise of the movie so and the poster probably with uh poster yeah with the head of the statue of liberty in the street which it's kind of it's obviously it's a good poster but it it does make you go yeah but how did the criminals like take off the head of the statue of liberty it doesn't make more sense i don't know did the duke send up a bunch of guys with just little saws just just 
spend years, <laughs> like literally decades, like sawing the head off. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Isn't the Statue of Liberty where the en entry point is? Because everything wraps around it, right? I think so, yeah. I think, I think uh, the base of the Statue of Liberty is the entry point, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I suppose we'll rate Escape from New York. Um, obviously, it has its charms and it has a lot of things that people like. Like, I get why people do like it. There's a lot of things in here that is likable. Yeah. And I, and I like totally. a lot of those things. I just think the story, the script, just isn't there to actually make it all come together, sadly. Um, you know, and I kind of felt that same way about the Warriors, funnily enough, which I think is a very, you know, I wasn't even going to, th I wasn't even thinking about comparing it to that, but it's because you brought up the different gangs, it made me think of that. And mm. I'm like, I think it's a very apt sort of similar feeling I have with that film as well, where I'm like, oh, this premise is great, but I'm just not feeling the actual characters and the story progression. So what are you rating Escape from New York? Out of 10? Um... I, I did really en enjoy watching it. Like, uh, there's something about it that kept it from being great for me, but it still felt special because of, I think, because of the character of Snake and that Kurt Russell was playing him and he's always very engaging to watch. Um, I liked a lot of the side characters. I love seeing all the actors that I'm so familiar with do a role like this. I think, like, Harry Dean Stanton was a fun um, surprise. And Lee Van Cleef also. I mean, I don't know exactly what Van Cleef's, you know, filmography was like after the Leone movies he did, but um, maybe he did more schlocky stuff. But I like that a lot. Um, and I like the model work a lot. And some of the set uh -huh. pieces I thought were really cool, like uh, especially the, the, the mind bridge area. Where there's yeah. just like stuff on fire everywhere i thought that a lot of the set designs were really cool so i'm still gonna go with a 7.5 because i definitely think it's a good movie it's just not quite great yeah i i think i'm gonna go with a six uh and maybe i sounded more negative than that but i still like a lot of things in it i still think mm -hmm. the, the the styles there I, I love how it looks i love the feel of when he's entering the city and the first few scenes of him walking around the streets uh it's after that where i think it actually just kind of it goes downhill for me but um i i do think it's very watchable and i think there's a lot of things to like about it but it's just not uh you know it just doesn't come together so uh but six out of ten for me still uh so weaker carpenter movie but definitely something that's and he uh, didn't do the sequel right he did oh he did he did escape from la also that's one of the, the his 90s movies that showed his prime was over <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, would have been at least 10 years then from this movie yeah it's the, early, it's the early 90s yeah uh the second okay. one yeah i yeah i mean i'm sure we'll do it at some point uh because now we've done the first one but uh i can't say i'm looking forward to revisiting that maybe maybe that one will just be so nonsensical that i'll just get into it i think i might like some of the set pieces if it because i live in la <sighs> I remember a really stupid surfing moment. <laughs> All right, that sounds great. <laughs> but I, hmm, yeah, uh, <laughs> that I I remember a stupid surfing moment. I I feel like they went they doubled down and just like sort of like seeing what kind of weirdos the criminals have turned into. Um, mm -hmm. but me not really thinking what they've turned into is that interesting. And I kind of feel that way in this movie where. The more I meet characters like the Duke, the more the less I'm like, this isn't actually that interesting, like what they've become. Um, mm. There's probably more interesting things you could have like said about, oh, this is the, the weird society they've formed because they've been left on their own kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But Well, Lee Van Cleef won't be it because he was dead before then. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he's in the, uh, in the second one. That makes sense. That's too bad. Uh, yeah, the second one, it was 1996 even. It was even later than that. So wow. 15, 15 years, give or take, from the first one. Um, Is Tom Atkins in it? Uh, I'm sleeping. I don't <laughs> think Tom Atkins is in there. But I can tell you that in addition to Steve Buscemi, we have Stacey Keach. Oh, yeah. We have Pam Greer. All right. Jackie Brown. We have Peter Fonda. Okay. And prestige. in a relatively small role, I assume, but we have a cameo by Bruce Campbell, which 
<laughs> get in. All right. This sounds great. I mean, it sounds great. <laughs> Let's knock it out. Oh, dear. Uh, what will we do next time? It's like a good question. What are we doing next time? Another 80s movie. Is it? Are we on Tron next? Is Tron, is Tron the next? We could just make it next. <laughs> I think it's Tron. I think, I think we're on Tron next. Uh, I'm double checking, but I think we're on Tron. Tron sounds good. We can do that. You've never seen Tron, so that'll be exciting. I have seen Tron. Oh, I thought you said you never saw it. No, I've never seen Tron Legacy. Yeah. I thought you never saw it because you never saw the first Tron. No, I never saw it because I didn't leak the first Tron. <laughs> yeah, I watched Tron with friends uh, many years ago, and I remember I didn't enjoy it very much. Mm -hmm. But I love the sequel. Well, yeah, apparently we're in a little phase right now of doing movies that have got cult followings where I'm going to piss off the lovers of the movies because, you know, I've, I've, I've been lukewarm on Escape from New York. I mean... I remember being bored to tears when I watched Tron the first time, so we'll see how well, positive I am next time. I think the thing from Tron I remember being missing was the music. I remember the music not mm. being prevalent enough. There's a lot of scenes that didn't have, have it, I think. And I thought this movie could really use some atmosphere. Uh, it uh, looks cool. Like, it's a really cool looking movie. All I'm going to say is that next week, if I upset you with my Tron takes, just come back after okay don't 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 leave in disgust <laughs> hey you're a people... fan of bruce boxlighter now so you have a whole different perspective on this film but people people the, 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 there is like a cult following for tron who love that movie to death like they really care about it um admittedly i've not heard it from them in a long time but they were very vocal right before the sequel came out i remember the internet a lot of people like oh my god they're doing a tron sequel and then i watched tron and thought this is this isn't that good <laughs> why do you people like this movie so much now i've only seen it once maybe that maybe this will be a situation where i see the light and i i appreciate it in a new way yeah but... i don't think i don't think that's gonna happen <laughs> the fact that I you mean, also you have a negative like fox light no more but is he in the first one? Oh yeah he's tron is it if i recall i think that's his character's name right okay i'll take your word for it but <laughs> I, I, uh, whatever <laughs> we'll find out we'll find out next week All right, so we're okay. doing Tron um, and we'll see how it goes and then after Tron it's time to get back to Transformers sequels gross <laughs> gross so let us know what you think of of uh, Escape from New York in the comments. You can like and subscribe. You can, of course, support all the content over at patreon.com slash TV and get yourself bonus content. We do bonus episodes on a monthly basis, give or take. Um, the last one we did was... Was it Cyclone we did last? That was such a good movie. Or was it something after Cyclone? I can't remember. Uh, but... Yeah, that was recently. Once we anyway. do them, they're gone. Yeah, we, we, we've done Cyclone. We've done. We do, we do sometimes. We'll do like the the sort of the the sequels. They don't oh, really Space deserve. Space Mutiny was the last one. Oh, Space Mutiny was the last. That's right. But sometimes we do sequels that aren't you know. So we did all the sequels to Tremors. We had Tremors on the regular show, but we did all the bonus. We did all the sequels on the bonus episodes, uh, for that. And we've done that for a couple things. So you can get those at the five dollar tier. You get access to Meltdown, which is a monthly show where me and Tara just talk about all the different movies we've been watching. Not sci-fi, just all the movies we've been watching that weren't for reviews, and give each other a sci-fi quiz. So it's kind of a fun, just a casual catch up with each other on movies episode once a month. So if that Pretty sounds fun. like fun, uh, and you want content as well from other shows that we do on Mail Fuzz movies, then go check out the Patreon. Uh, but any and all support, of course, is appreciated. We appreciate it, loads. Thank you very much. Yes. Give us money. This is <laughs> the science fiction <laughs> podcast. The Atomic Cinema Experiment. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Keep watching sci-fi. A computer at Salsa.